Matt, thank you for coming on, man. This is exciting. Exciting for me, brother. I've, I've heard great things. I've listened to a few episodes. Awesome, awesome content. You clearly, you do your research and you care to make the guests feel special, heard, appreciated. So I commend you for taking the time to do that. Right on. I appreciate that. The way I came about um, hearing your name is from a buddy named Luke Lammy, who you may know. Mm. He said he met you and I, I looked you up on Instagram. I was like immediately followed. And, and when I want to have people on, it kind of varies on like how long I'll follow them or check them out. I think I followed you for like a day and I'm like, yeah, I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, man. That was like a week ago. Man, I, I, I do the exact same thing. It's funny. Social media is really your digital resume. And I feel like if you have authentic content, you kind of attract other people who do the same thing. And I mean, that's why Harry and Brett have amassed such a following. They're just putting out stuff that they truly believe in that's authentic to themselves. And so I, I echo those sentiments. Yeah, there, those, that's a perfect example of how to portray yourself authentically on social media, those mm -hmm. guys. 100%. Um, you're also up there. Um, we were just talking about my story, but I kind of want to flip it um, back to you. It's interesting uh, when I have people on the podcast, just understanding where they come from, mm -hmm. to me, is like one of the most important things. And I know a lot of podcasts actually, like some people look down on that, like going through the story of somebody, it seems kind of arbitrary, but to me, it's like literally the most important thing for me and you to have a conversation is you understanding me and me understanding you. So I'm curious how you got to where you are now as 25 year old Matt from where you were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, whenever I think about being asked this question, I, I have this natural feeling to respond in, I grew up here, graduated, and then just started working. But there's so much more to the story. And I realized the importance of that to paint that picture of how I got to where I was. So I'll try to get as granular as I can and um, really paint the picture from start to finish. But I mean, it's, it's simply born and raised in Austin. Um, and something that was different about my family that affected how I grew up was my dad was in a wheelchair, paralyzed, got in a car wreck when he was in his 20s. And so early on, there was feelings of being different and feeling less than because I would go to basketball games, for example, or I'd go to my sister's volleyball tournaments and we'd go into the, we'd, we'd walk, you know, I'd walk in and my dad would be rolling in front of me and kids would point at him at a young age and, and ask, you know, mommy, what, what's wrong with him? Why, why is he in a wheelchair? And as a young kid, you start to think because there's something wrong with him, there's something wrong with you. And so I started to build this inferiority complex, which made me really shy and, and later in life made me act out in other ways because I wanted to prove to other people that I was okay, that I was normal, that my family wasn't different, that I wasn't different. And once I got to high school, uh, the thing that really helped me break out of my shell and connect with people and, and get loose and make friends was alcohol. And so I started drinking really early at the age of 13, 14 was when I had my first drink and that kind of um, stuck with me until the point I turned 18 when everything really just came crumbling down. You know, I used alcohol as my buddy, as my supporter, as my crutch. It was my coping mechanism, the thing that I fell back on. And without it, I felt like I'd, I'd crumble. Um, but ironically, I, I crumbled anyway. You know, like I just, I couldn't not drink. It was the thing I, I used to get through the day, if I had uh, a bad day, I would drink. If I did bad on a test, I'd drink. If I got into an argument with my girlfriend at the time, I'd drink. And it got to the point where I was hurting the people closest to me, my family, my friends, and ultimately myself. And I got to college. All my friends went off to different universities, and I was the one kid that stayed at home or felt like I was the only kid that stayed at home and went to community college and I was the high school hero, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, and, and that affected my, my confidence. It really did. And so I started drinking more and more and more. And it got to the point where, um, I would wake up in the mornings and my hands would be, would be shaking. You know, I needed that drink. I needed to take the edge off. And I got a DWI one night. Um, I got caught 
doing some, some stuff I shouldn't have been doing at Walmart and I'm forever banned from going to Walmart. <laughs> There's worse it. places to be banned from. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Um, not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, everything just, it started adding up and I, I, my father what, what at the time was sober for, I think, um, 15 or 16 years. And my grandpa had been heavily involved in AA for the latter part of his life. And he just, my dad just would sit me down over and over and be like, look, man, I'm not going to tell you what to do. It's your life, but just know that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And we have problems drinking in our family. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, he just kept planting that seed, kept planting that seed, kept planting the seed. And the crazy part was, you know, I get this DWI, end up trying to, to, to run at the time. <clears throat> the cops were put on the lights behind me. I was going 140 miles one direction. And as soon as they caught up, I turned the car around and started going the other direction, <laughs> just <laughs> thinking that I could get away. But, you know, clearly that was, that was silly and stupid. Um, but what saved me and, and truly what saved my life was getting pulled over that night because my plan was to go as fast as I could and hope that I would lose control. And it was just because I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired. Alcohol truly brought, brought me to my knees. And um, <clears throat> the crazy part was I'm, I'm in jail that night and all I want to do is drink. You know, like that was just my thing. That was the only way that I could make things better. And it wasn't until two or three months after that, that I just decided one day, like enough's enough. And I just, I gave it up. Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of what started me on this self-development journey, you know, just trying to be the best version of myself that I can possibly be every single given day and started reading books. I think the first book I picked up was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And it just opened my eyes to the possibilities of, what could be and what I could make of myself in life. And um, from there started uh, trying to build different companies. You know, I'm, <laughs> I, I, so, I, I call myself a self-proclaimed entrepreneur. I feel like a lot of us do, but, and, and anybody who kind of has that entrepreneurial mindset, it's like you, get, you have an idea, you work on it for two weeks and then you have that, you know, flashy, uh, object syndrome and go work on something else for two weeks and two weeks and two weeks. And so, um, you know, kind of went through that for a, a few years until I read a book called, um, the go giver by Bob Berg. And it just taught me the importance of giving selflessly. And it's also, you know, what you learn in the book, how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. It's like, how can you, add value to the lives of others. And that's when I started Riser. And <clears throat> since then, there's been no other business ideas that have come my, come my way. It's, it's just truly been connecting people, helping other people get one step closer to where they want to go. And it's unlocked so many doors for me in my life. <clears throat> Firstly, thank you for sharing that. That's um, certainly not like the easiest thing for you to talk about in your life, I'm sure. Mm. There's a lot to unpack. Um, it's I want to go back to your dad, actually, um, not not too deep, but just the idea of you walking into a gym. I remember like playing sports when you're young. It really is one of those things like you walk in with your family and it's kind of like a representation of you. You get tied in with that. So 100 percent. How do you think that that? Uh, I don't know exactly how you worded it, but like he's different, so I must be different. How How is that kind of translated into you now? Do you still have that kind of feeling that you're just different, man? So. I wrote a book, I guess that's a, a part of my story that, that I, I haven't included. Um, when I was in college, I still had that inferiority complex and it turned from using drinking as a way to cope to working as a way to cope. And I worked my butt off, man. And I still felt less than, so I felt like a way to showcase that I wasn't less than was to pay for college myself and pay for my apartment myself and pay for my first car and pay for trips and just do everything on my own to prove to people that I'm strong, that I'm, that I can hold my own. And that was my coping mechanism at that time. And through that, 
I wrote a book about how to graduate from college debt free. And I felt like in order to paint a picture that I wasn't different and that people can relate to me and my story, I had to share my story. So the first half of the book was my childhood leading up to that point in time. And then the second half was tips and tricks, how to graduate from college debt free, how to work your way through it and, and how to um, make it happen by yourself with no help from your parents or uh, from a guardian of some sort. And as I was writing the book, I realized that my entire life was, a, was the story that I had painted of being a victim. And I realized the reason why I felt less than was because of those early moments um, when I was out with my family. And also realized that you can change the story that you tell yourself. And so to answer your question, it wasn't until I published that book that I had worked through some of, you know, worked through most of that. And um, I think that's also a testament for anybody who might have stories about themselves. Really analyze that story, question that story, and take moments to be with yourself 100%. Like introspection, I think, is incredibly valuable. Spend time in isolation just by yourself. And uh, by, by doing that during the time that I was writing my book, it really helped me shed some of those, those layers um, to get to the core of who I am. And, and that's not a victim. That's not somebody that, uh, you know, blames their situation for where they are in life. And so once you get to the core of who you are, then you can rebuild. And that's been the best thing I've ever done in my life. Absolutely. The, the thing that I just got reminded of is from Vic victim to victor mm. so it's it's that same amount of letters same start yeah. to a word but it's entirely different life you know mm -hmm. but it's just that that paradigm shift and uh back back to your your alcohol use it's so fascinating to me how alcohol particularly is such a big part of so many people's youth mm. childhood as it relates to social um and also just like dealing with the struggles of life. It, it's interesting to me because I didn't drink until I was 20. Mm. So I went all through, I was like the kid in my friend group. I didn't drink. Everybody asked me why I'm like, wow, I don't know. Everybody in my family drank. Yeah. Not really any, uh, like maybe one alcoholic couple, couple people removed from me. So I, I, people ask me why. And I honestly don't know. Just never took interest in it. I just had, I was a baseball player, so I, I kind of used that as like, oh, I want to be good at baseball, but I, I honestly just don't know. Like, I just never started drinking. Wow. And I just figured, it, you know what, I I, uh, I guess I'll just keep going. <laughs> and then, uh, obviously, at, at, like I mentioned, I think like back, almost when I was 21, so mm -hmm. almost legal age, um, I drank. And it's so interesting how that forced me, because I was social as well. The, the thing that I think about though, as it relates to surrounding yourself with people, my girlfriend also didn't drink. So we were like the two people in our friend group that didn't drink, which made it a lot easier for me. 100%. So I'm curious, did you, were like all of your friends drinkers as well? So the friends that I started drinking with were friends that had a lack of supervision. Parents were divorced, mother was working till eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. And so that was kind of just where we went to, to do everything. No, <laughs> not just drinking. Um, but I, I definitely, it, that wasn't necessarily my core friend group. It was just guys in the neighborhood that I could kind of sneak off and do some debaucherous stuff with and not feel bad about it. Cause my true, you know, friends, um, I, I think probably would have given me a hard time at, at that age. But as I got older, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18, all of us were, were doing that. And it, and I don't, you know, there's no blame either. You know, it's like, that was just what we did. You know, that's what, I, I guess that's a bad stereotype, but I, I listen to this speech every once in a while. And the guy talks about, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, that's what you do. You go crack beers and smoke pot on the back porch. That's just, that's kind of the lifestyle in high school, um, which I think, we can change, you know, the culture can change. Um, but yeah, you know, that's, that was just the environment. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Cause I think you're exactly right. That is kind of like the American yeah. high schooler 
It's just <laughs> yeah. what you do, right? You just go to parties, you drink a little yep. bit, you 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 do you, you kind of test the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um did you play sports growing up? Yeah, I did play sports until I turned 15, my sophomore year of high school and started drinking and everything kind of transitioned. So my focus was no longer athletics, it was no longer academics, it was just playing I mean it was just partying and working, making money. Like that was that was my identity. Yeah, because you're you're a tall dude, athletic, yeah. so I figured you you'd do something, but it kind of ties into like the first thing now that I want to get into in terms of your life. This this whole like 75 hard, Iron Man, yeah. all these physical challenges, dude. Mm. Run, run me through your thought process on like what changed for you to get into these incredibly difficult physical endeavors. Yeah, so I talked to talked about this a little bit um, the other day with, with a friend of ours, Harry. And I feel like every year of my life has been a different season. One of the years has been focused on publishing the book and being an author. The next year, the identity has been consumed in making as much money as I possibly could. The next year has been consumed in, in fitness challenges. And I like to do it that way because I like to challenge myself and I like to set an intention for the year. And so this year, 2023, was me really trying to dial in my health and optimize my health and nutrition and fitness because... What I realized during 75 hard was I looked at myself in the mirror and thought that I was healthy and that I was in the best shape possible, but that was a lie. And I, I think until you truly dive into something fully, you can't truly know whether or not you are doing as much as you can. And I was half-assing my, my fitness, you know, I, I truly was. Um, but I just wanted to challenge, man. I just, I can't, like, I'm not the t type of person that can keep still. I, I want to continue to s push the limits, push the boundaries, see what I'm capable of. And I felt like 75 hard was a great start to that. I had met a lot of people who had done it themselves, a lot of friends who've done it, and their transformations were phenomenal, not just physical transformation, but the mental transformation as well. And how they've used that and applied that to their life after the challenge ended. And so 75 hard was, was that just seeing if I could stay disciplined and consistent with just simply exercising every single day, reading a book every single day, uh, not eating sweets, which was probably the hardest thing. I, I find myself having really having a lot of trouble with impulse control. And I guess that goes into drinking and, you know, the other, um, addictive, traits that, that I may have. I mean, it could be working a lot, could yeah. be doing fitness challenges a lot. I mean, they all kind of go hand in hand, but I mean, it could be your superpower power too. If you, um, I mean, to your word, victim and, and Victor, right. Just if you use it, uh, for, for the greater good. Um, but yeah, it started with 75 hard, really phenomenal experience, but I felt like I could do more. And so I started looking into some audacious, goals. And one of those was doing a, a half Ironman, not a full, I can't give myself that credit quite yet. Um, and then during that, that, that season, I, uh, after 75 hard and was kind of just like taking things easy, looking for that next challenge, I signed up for the half Ironman and then I tore my ACL and I was super bummed about it. But in the back of my mind, I, from the day I tore my ACL, I was like, I'm still doing that Ironman. There was, there was not one second where I thought I'm going to get surgery and I'm just going to postpone this a year. I'm like, I'm like, no, not a chance. I'm going to do this. And if, whenever I set my mind some, to something, like, I, I will do it. I will accomplish it. And uh, it's just like keeping promises to yourself, you know? And so I remember the first few weeks, man, it was awful. I could barely walk. I couldn't, I couldn't bend my knee. Um, and... Uh, there was some hesitation there. I was like, you know, maybe I have to do a half Ironman later in the year, like November to December. I don't know if I'll be able to do it in time in October, um, but just continue to rehab, continue to do all the things that was necessary to rebuild the muscles and the ligaments around the ACL, knowing that the ACL itself wasn't going to be strong enough. Um, and next thing you know, it's October and I'm a, f you know, a few weeks out and I'm like, well, here we are, like, I'm going to do the damn thing, and then you finish it, and um, 
Yeah, man, I, I was just thinking about it last night, those early, those early weeks and those early days where I could, I would hop on the bike, but I wouldn't be able to, I had to put my seat up so, so high because if it was at the height it was supposed to be, I couldn't bend my knee fully, you know? So I was, I was just pedaling like this <laughs> the whole time because it would, it was just too painful. Um, and then just going up the stairs at my house just over and over and over, walking upstairs, downstairs, upstairs, downstairs, and then going out into the gym and, and getting resistance bands and just having, uh, you know, straightening my leg over and over and over. And my friends, uh, you know, thought I was crazy and my orthopedic surgeon thought I was crazy. And, you know, my mom was like, you're crazy. And, you know, I almost get fuel from that. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I love that sort of thing. I love proving people wrong and proving myself right. And so... That's what happened. I think there's moments in life where we d we can and do distinctly feel God or or whatever. Like just we feel the 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 full weight of life in the best way possible. Was finishing that Ironman one of those moments for you? Man, it was. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Just the underdog feeling the overcoming feeling has been a story of mine my whole life and um defying odds always feels good but i didn't think that i was going to finish because i didn't know the rules of an, <laughs> a half iron man so there's time slots that you have to finish uh in order to move on to the next uh, part of the race. So you have to do your swim in an hour, 10 minutes. If you don't, then it's, I'm pretty sure they kick you off the course. If you don't <laughs> finish your bike after that in five hours, 30 minutes, then same thing. They're not going to let you finish the run. Um, and I could be wrong, but, um, yeah, so my tire blew on mile seven and being a first time triathlete period, not just Ironman, uh, racer, but triathlete, like I didn't have an extra, I didn't have a spare tire. <laughs> so dude, I was sitting there for an hour and 10 minutes, just waiting for them to come and get me a tire. And finally someone came and when they showed up, they're like, what's going on? I'm like, I have a flat. They're like, okay, cool. Pull out your, your spare. I'm like, I don't have a spare, you know? So they had to send back a few bike techs until finally a bike tech had one uh, to give to me. Um, and so I was hustling, trying to get caught up because I didn't think I was going to make the cutoff. And because I was going so, so hard, I started cramping up in both of my my quads and I would hop off my bike and I'd lay in the grass and people would be dry, like, you know, going by like, Hey, do you need medical attention? I'm like, no, like I'm going to just give me a second. I'm just cramping. <laughs> I'd go three miles, have to get back off the bike because both my quads would cramp up and that happened over and over. And so when I rolled in to, uh, to get to the portion of the run, I didn't think that I had made cutoff and it wasn't until there was people running behind me, you know, throwing their stuff off, throwing their shoes on and, and, and starting to chop to the, the start of the, the run that I realized like I still had time. Um, so because of that, I mean, there's a lot of emotions, like the last 20 minutes of the bike ride, like I was nearly in tears cause I had trained and done all this and I'd torn my ACL and didn't get surgery. And, you know, I was, I was going to be a failure. Like, I mean, that was my mindset at the time. I was like, man, like telling all these people that have wished me good luck, all these people that have encouraged me to, uh, keep going and not give up and having to go back to all of them and tell them that I didn't finish or that I DNC'd, which is did not complete. Like that was, I mean, that was heartbreaking for me at the time. Um, so when I did finish, you know, I was just looking back at the entire race and the flood of emotions. It's such a roller coaster ride. Anybody who's done an, a long endurance race could tell you there's moments midway through the race where you're, you, you don't know if you're going to be able to keep pushing through. And so it was like a larger than life moment. And, um, one of the greatest things that, that I've done up to this point that I, in my opinion, um, and, uh, for anybody who's interested in doing a long endurance race, I, I highly recommend it cause it's so rewarding. There's a, there, there's like a commonality in my life right now. It's kind of, I, I, I just feel like God's pushing me in that direction and I'll elaborate. So there's a guy named Bo Waters who I've had on the podcast who was a an Aussie real Aussie rules football player, which mm -hmm. is like the NFL of Australia. It's biggest sport there. Huge. And they it's a 220 yard field, so they run like 
he actually holds a record in his at his club. He ran 14 point something miles in a single game, single match. Wow. So literally a half marathon in a match. And it's like football, so he's like hitting people too. It's insane. Dude, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he holds another record too for most surgeries during a career. He had like 32 surgeries. <laughs> Knees, shoulders, hands, ankles, feet, dude, hands. He's an absolute savage. Neck, yeah. And uh, Savage. He finished up his career because he's like, okay, dude, like I can't keep getting surgeries. I need to do something. Yeah. So he gets into Ironmans. And obviously he's in an one percent of one percent shape in terms of like physical condition so he wins like the australian amateur iron man for his age group and then competes in the the world in in kona twice wow and he in the podcast he talks about this moment where he was i don't remember the exact hill but in the hawaiian world championship iron man he remembers this like visceral feeling of, of of like of peace almost in the midst of just like this immense pain because the way he worded it is like I knew for a fact in that moment I gave every single thing that I was like capable of giving mm. and I feel like there's only a few arenas in terms of physically that you can put yourself in where you really know okay like I literally did everything I could in that moment Iron Man's being one of them and now I got you I got Harry and Brett I got Jack I got my buddy James is training for one so you got to do it. I, I think you got to yeah. do it. The signs are there, brother. Oh gosh, yeah, that's that's one of those things too cuz it's it's uh once you commit to it like it it you you mentioned a failure. So I wrote down physical truths because the thing about physical endeavors, like weightlifting for example, it's so cut and dry. Like either you lift the weight or you don't. Either you fail that rep or you don't. It's like succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. It's literally that simple. It's the truth. Iron Man, same exact thing. You were either going to finish that or you weren't. You were either yep. going to succeed or you are going to fail, no matter what the ACL, the quads, the cramping, all these things. Um, no matter what happened, you were either going to succeed or fail. You obviously succeeded in that instance. And I'm curious if there's any lessons that you extrapolate from that particular race that carry over to other parts of your life. The decisions you make... help everybody else also in that arena. What I mean by that is, man, I almost get emotional thinking about it. <clears throat> it was at the end of the bike ride and there's <laughs> a guy next to me who's, you know, watching me continue to get off the bike, cramp, sit on the side of the road and he'll pass me up. And then I'll get back on the bike and I'm like, I'm going to fucking finish. Like, I'm not going to give up. I'd go three miles, I'd pass him, and then he'd see me again on the side because I was just cramping. Like, over and over, it happened for like 15 miles. So I should, matter of fact, this was the last hour, the not, not the last 20 minutes. Um, and then within the last 20 minutes, I get back on my bike, and I didn't think that I was going to make the, the time cut off. And so I just started biking next to him, and we were talking to each other because he thought that he had missed the bike cut off too. Both of our first ever... Ironmans and said, how do you feel, man? Hoping that he would say something to help me feel better. I was just looking for some reassurance. And uh, he goes, you know, sometimes it's just not your day. But I was hoping that he was going to say something like, come on, man, let's fight. Let's keep going. Like, we got it. We, maybe we can make it. Let's just, let's push ourselves. But he's like, you know, sometimes it's just not your day, man. I'm like, well, shoot, if they still let us run whenever we get back, like, are you going to do it? He goes, man, I don't think so. You know, it just, I'm, I'm pretty beat up right now. I, I, I learned from this. I got to do more training. I got to hydrate better beforehand. My nutrition plan needs to be better. And that kind of upset me a little bit, you know, cause I, I wanted him to be like, no, oh, we got it. Like, let's, let's make it happen. Um, but I understood, you know, like it's, it's, it's a lot. Like it really is a lot. So when we get back, um, we both kind of ride in together and I, you know, he went to go put his bike up. I went to put my bike up. So I, you know, I was kind of one of the things where I was like, nah, it's like, dude, I'll, I'll probably never see you again. <laughs> Great talking to you. Like, I hope that you do another one. You know, don't, don't take this too, you know, too tough, too diff. No, like, dude, just try again. You know, we fail, try again. Um, but then I found out that we could <clears throat> still run. So I'm running and about three or four miles into the run, I, I see him 
And uh, he just gave me a nod and there were no words exchanged, but I think the nod was, I'm running because you convinced me to do that. You know, I'm running because you still had that, that, that drive within you. And, and, and whenever he asked me if I was still going to run, I was like, absolutely. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to finish, you know, and I can't confirm that, you know, I can't confirm that's why he ended up running, but it was almost just like, just, I was dragging him along, dragging him along with me. And, uh, I know he finished or I, I, I hope he finished. And if I ever see him one day, it would be like a dream come true if he walked up to me and was like, dude, I didn't get a chance to tell you this, but like the reason I finished that Ironman was because of you. And uh, I think that's just a testament for life. It's like lead by example, do the things that are difficult to do and showcase to everybody else that they can't do it as well if they put their mind to it and put in the work. There's a, a quote. I think Mother Teresa said it, I'm not sure, but it's preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. Mm-hmm. So it speaks to the the power of actions and the yeah. idea that what you do, the way you act should speak so loudly that people can't hear what you say. Mm-hmm. It, because the reality is you could have been like, it, it, for example, if you said, dude, you definitely got to finish. I'm not going to finish. My knee's bummed. But, dude, you should definitely finish. Like, you're, dude, you're, you got this. But I... My knees bummed, dude. I'm cramping. I'm good. The likelihood of him doing that, extremely low. Yeah, yeah. Extremely low. Because he could pull out an excuse himself. He's like, you know what, dude? I'm I'm bummed too. My knee hurts. My leg yeah. hurts. Yeah. But I I don't know this guy. I bar- hardly know you, but I like to think that he did. Maybe he was walking to his car or something. He's like, you know what, dude? I just saw this guy cramp 15 times, get back on his bike, and yeah. he was sure as hell going to finish this race mm-hmm. or at least give him give it everything he could. That's a powerful lesson, man. Thank you, man. That's it. It reminds me of another thing. Nick, Nick was on the podcast, a buddy of mine, and he ran the Austin Marathon through some some charity or some organization, basically, where you run a marathon but you actually push a cart. Have you heard of this? Yeah, I have, and I have two friends, Evan Duvall and Keith Mitchhart, who did this. And I, I just want to say their names for anybody listening because those are two absolute dogs. And Keith actually did a 100-mile run through uh, Treling- Trelingua, Texas, which is down in Big Ben. I mean, 105 degrees. I mean, it's like there's pictures of him, and his entire body is covered in salt because he's just <laughs> just so much sweat is being dispersed. But, yeah, continue. The, uh, the premise, I, I don't want to botch this, but the premise is basically you run a marathon pushing somebody who can't. And so um, Nick had this cart and he got the, I would say at this point, he would probably agree with me, the the luck of the draw where he got a, a pretty, I think it was like a pretty heavy person. Yeah. And so he's, he remembers, he said like just these moments that he describes, a couple in particular where he didn't even say anything. He's like literally crying, running up a hill, pushing this cart. He's like in pain. Just so much physical pain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, I told him, I was like, I can't relate to that, dude. I've never done anything that hard. It's not, it's, it's one thing running a marathon. <laughs> it's <laughs> another thing pushing a large person. Yeah. Up a hill. <laughs> up a hill. Yeah. yeah. Like think about Austin, dude. Some of these hills are pretty steep. Um, and he says that there was this moment where he like, he was pretty much about to give out yeah. like, and not finish. He's yeah. about to face that hard truth of not finishing. The valiance of the effort is, is one thing, but the reality is that if you don't finish, you don't finish. And like almost as if God was just answering his, his prayer in the moment, a dude came up and was like, hey, I'm going to help you get this up, up here. Wow. So he came and pushed it. And then another person came, helped him push it. Hmm. And long story short, he pushes the cart. He finishes the race through a bunch of other, like, I mean, 26 plus miles with 200 pound human being pushing a cart. That's insane. And he remembers the, there's a lot of adoration or, or praise that's, perhaps not the weight of the praise is not very heavy. Mm. It's kind of just like banter. It's almost, Hey, good job, man. Like, yeah. Hey, pat on the butt. Good, good stuff, man. You killed that. He said that there was this moment where people were like coming up to him and he felt like he was being really seen. And the thing that he just did legitimately touched like and impacted other people. They're like, dude, what you just did is like, 
See, now I'm getting emotional. I don't even know why I wasn't even there. I didn't even do it. But just the idea that his actions and his perseverance alongside the actions of other people that helped him finish mm. were, were worthy of the heaviest praise. Yes. And like the realest praise. And I think that speaks to your lesson of the decisions you make. I don't, I don't know exactly what you said, but the decisions you make will help people in the same arena. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful lesson that only a certain few arenas, I believe, can really portray that in such a clear light. There's videos all over the internet um, that portray exactly this point that we're, we're talking about. And one of them's a video of a guy in the Olympics, and I think he tears his ACL or something. And you might, you've, I'm sure you've seen it. And his dad comes out and helps him finish the race, you know, puts his arm around him. They're hobbling to the finish. And there's, there's so much power and beauty in those moments because it just, I mean, that is, I think that is love. And that's why we're here. And I, th I think that's what connects humans. And that's what solves problems and People always say love is the answer, but you truly feel love in races like that. There's so many people cheering, so many people with posters, so many people there to hand out waters and Gatorade and electrolytes that aren't signed up as volunteers. They're just there along the way. And it really brings people together, man. I, I think other than it being a phenomenal personal accomplishment, just being in that environment is enough for me to encourage anybody to go out and sign up for a race. It's just so, it, it's, it's powerful, man. It's just powerful. The, the idea of love specifically is such like, it's, we treat it so abstractly. Like it's just like this ethereal thing that just exists yeah. that you kind of tap into. Yeah. But in reality, I think love is just action. Like it's it's a it's a certain type of action from a certain heart posture and a certain source that that you 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 take that action from that place, and that's love. And you're exactly right. In those instances, that's literally people loving another person. Mm -hmm. um, and there, I'm reminded of a word. I think it pronounced shaktipat. Have you ever heard of this word? I have not. It's it's a I believe it's a Hindu word or, or part of the Hindu religion or ideology and it refers to the physical transference of energy and the example that I was given and I there's a high percent chance I'm completely botching this. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds nice right yeah um, but the example that I was uh, told or, or heard so like why do people go to concerts especially now when I could just listen to the music on Spotify mm. you go to concerts because of Shaktipat because of a, a physical transference of energy that happens when a group of people are in the same physical place. There's like this yeah. resonance that happens. And I think that those races, there's obviously other arenas as well, other things that people do, but those races are, are a crystal clear example of, of the power of like physical transference of energy. So the, the, the runners and the crowd, they feed off of each other. I think the crowd gets inspiration from the runners who in their faces you can see are pushing themselves to their limit and the runners are feeding off of the encouragement and the empathy that the people bystanding and watching are giving them. It's like a, a, just a continuous transfer of energy. And there's so many times where you cramp up and you stop and the people that are watching you who, who've never met you before in their lives are just whispering keep going keep going don't give up like you got it like it hurts but keep going and then you start running again you know it's like uh, that's why I think that's why a lot of people during marathons and half marathons have their best races is just because there's endless support and encouragement of people just telling them to continue to push and push and push it's it's wonderful man it's wonderful uh, what's the what's the word again shaktipat Shaktipat. I like. I could be mispronouncing that. I could have just completely botched the uh, the you meaning just of it. Made it up. Yeah, dude, yeah. It's actually, it's just a word that I just made up. But uh, it sounds nice. No, but I actually do think that's a real thing, and that's how I was taught. So that's how I understand it. It makes a lot of sense to me because the example you just gave. 
Very few records are broken solo. Yes. Maybe a few, but the marathon record, typically going to be in an actual marathon where there's race and there's that energy, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same that goes for, I've spoken about this with uh, a couple MMA fighters, the idea of David Goggins. And uh, there's, there's select people out there that can actually, I believe, tap into like 100% of their potential by themselves or close to it. But the reality is there's levels to it. It's like you training with a friend, you're going to do better, especially brotherhood. It's like, okay, I'm not going to lose to you. He's not going to lose to me. It's like, we're going to keep going. Then you get in a group of people and then something happens and you push, everybody pushes each other a little bit further. Then you throw a coach in there and then the coach is like the, the, the fuel. So then everybody and the coach gets better. And then you throw a stadium full of people or a, a, a road packed with people and you get just this culmination of energy that you're that leads to exactly what you're saying it's like the the tiny little voices that are combating with the voices in your own head where it's like dude just chill you can stop and then you hear somebody go hey keep going you're like yeah. fuck i gotta keep going. <laughs> yeah. um but it's just powerful man you might I, i've i've realized that there's people that are like salesmen for different things harry being a salesman of austin yeah harry like First time I got coffee with him, I was like, yeah, I need to, I need to be in Austin. <laughs> yeah, like I'm moving here. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much sold on doing a, uh, <laughs> doing an endurance race. You, yeah, you 100% should, man. You 100% should. <laughs> the, uh, the, there was something else you mentioned with, with Harry on y'all's episode about a cold plunge. You <laughs> oh, yeah. Because I, I've done some stuff in the cold as well, not to that extent, um, but some stuff that people think is pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. can, can you unpack that story for us? Yeah, so I, you know, it's interesting. I, I'll get into cold plunges sometimes and I get this full body state of Zen that just comes across me. I, I, I can't describe it in any other way of, I just feel good and I feel like I can go longer. And I usually stop at anywhere between three and seven minutes just because the science says that's all you need. Um, but I was always curious to see how long I could go. And I did some research and it said that hypothermia sets in at like 20 minutes and, um, your heart could stop at 30 minutes and at 40 minutes, hundred percent, you're, you're, you know, you're dead. But then you see guys like Wim Hof who can go into a cold plunge for two hours. So I always ask myself if somebody else can do it. Why can't I? And I wanted to see what I was, I was capable of. So I reached out to two of my friends. They own a, own a cold plunge company called Cold Ones, Noah Walker and Kate Bollinger, and asked if they'd allow me to go in their cold plunge for 40 minutes at 40 degrees. And both of them said no at first. <laughs> Good friends, probably. Yeah, great <laughs> friends. Um, and I asked again, and they said no. Um, and I said, no, look, seriously, I think I can do it. You can be there to supervise and make sure that I'm okay, but please just let me try. And so they gave in and probably had to sign a liability. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. They, they should have, dude. It was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Once I got to 30, once I got to 25 minutes, I was just, you know, shivering uncontrollably. And then once I got to 30 minutes, I was like kind of coming in and out. But I, again, just like the, the Iron Man, I will go until literally I can. And um, I had already gotten 30 minutes, dude. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> I'm finishing this shit. Yeah. Um, and then 40 minutes hits and, you know, I get out and I can barely walk and they, they have to help me to the to the shower and I'm in the warm shower for 50 minutes. And the only reason I got out was because the warm water had, uh, had run out. Um, but again, like all the people who said that I couldn't do it and even myself having some doubts was eye opening in the sense that you can, like you can, and then what else can you do? So I did a three minute breath hold. And then what else can you do? I did a Spartan race with a torn ACL. It's like, what else can you do? So now I'm just like, I'm obsessed, just like pushing the limits and seeing what's possible and see what we're capable of. And that just translates to other fac uh, facets of life as well. It's like, 
now whenever I'm, I'm working, it's like, I can go an extra two hours. You know, I can stay up a little bit later. I can wake up a little bit earlier. Um, with food, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, I have a really bad problem with impulse control, but now I can wait another hour before I eat. Um, it just, man, it's, it compounds, it all compounds. And I think doing difficult shit is necessary. And that's just my humble opinion, but man, just challenge yourself. Just do it. There's, so the, the, to wrap that up, it's like, it was 40 minutes and 40 degrees. So. Yeah. I forgot to mention, I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> That's actually insane. Um, I, I've done a cut, like probably, I don't know, five or six, 10 minute sessions in 32, mm -hmm. like 32, 33 in a Morosco Forge. You have, mm -hmm. dude, that's, that's and, intense. It, hey, 32, between 32 and 40 degrees, that eight degree difference is a big difference. It, 32 is. is very, very cold. I'm, I'm, I don't say that in any type of way to like com combat what you, you, what you did is significantly more difficult. But what I will say is that I, I've told people that before and they're like, why? <laughs> like, like why? I'm yeah, like, there's no need. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Fuck, dude. Like Rogan did 20 minutes. I might yeah. as well see if I can do 10, yeah. whatever. We'll yeah. find out. Um, and I will tell you, even in that 10 minutes, like just when, when, there's certain things that you can do that increase the potency of pressure. Mm. And in those times, the lessons that you learn are also increase in potency, if that makes sense. Yes. So like walking through a day, you might not learn many lessons, but putting yourself through an incredibly difficult 10 minute or 40 minute sessions, it's almost like a, a certain portion of an entire lifetime of lessons. And it sounds like you learned that. I'm also, I'm blessed to be acquainted with a, a woman named Peyton Elroy, who has been on the show. Um, her episode hasn't released yet, but she did a 14 day fast. Wow. The first seven of those were no water. Really? Yep. Seven? Seven days with seven no water. Days. And th that's exactly the same reaction that, that most people I've talked to about that or brought that up with. Also people say why, also people say that's not safe. Her whole point was the exact same thing. She's like, I just wanted to see, like, we get told this, we get told like the science says this, the science says this. David Goggins is another example. Like his first hundred mile race, he had ran like a mile that whole year or something crazy like that. It's like, yeah, that's so dangerous. We'll see. <laughs> like, We're going to we'll find see. out. Um, but yeah, there's these, there's these times in your life that, that you can really increase your growth like exponentially in a short period of time and doing those types of things. I'm not saying everybody should go do a 14 day fast or a seven day, no water, fast no water yeah. or a 40 minute cold plunge or anything like that. I'm really not. Um, that's, it's like those disclaimers. This is not medical advice. This is not. Yeah. Yeah. Advice. We'll have to add that yeah. right now. To the um, episode. But the, the word I've been saying is like, why? Like people ask about the 10 minutes. Why? 14 day fast. Why? 40 minute cold plunge. Why? That's a great question. I, I feel like it's a tough question to answer because I feel like there's multiple answers, but I think, and I say this as humbly as, as I can, and I'd be interested to hear your take on this because it's something I think about from time to time, but I don't get a chance to really ask people. But I'm going to ask you first, and then I'm going to get into the answer. Do you, do you ever feel that you're meant for more and there's been a higher calling and higher purpose for your life? Maybe you're working out by yourself on a track, and after you do a grueling workout, you, you look up and you have your arms spread out and you're just looking up in the air like you're in an arena with hundreds of thousands of people feeling you are the main character and you have a higher purpose of, of being here. Do you ever have those, those feelings or have you ever felt that before? There's... This is a personal answer. Like, I don't want to speak for anybody else. There has been, this is why I was so curious about you. You're, you're saying like, my dad's different, so I must be different. 
I, I alluded to the example of me not drinking. Like, mm. for some reason, I've never really been afraid of being like, dude, that guy over there. Like, <laughs> He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't drink. Yep. Like, what? This guy goes to sleep at nine o'clock. Like, wh- like this guy wakes up and does this. This guy does that. I've never really been afraid of being that guy who people whisper about. I don't know why. Um, perhaps one day I'll learn. And I, I preface the answer by saying with that, because th- there are, there have been times in my life where I've done things when nobody's watching, like the 10 minute cold plunges, for example, um, and, and other things where it's, you, I, I, I've, I've bought, gotten brought to my knees before, like not like not even praying to God, but just like overwhelmed with some sense of like, okay, I, I want to feel more of this. And it's that feeling of, of not being different in a good way, but like being more in a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't even know if this answers your question, uh, I, I haven't had that exact same sensation of like literally thinking I'm in an arena, but I've had sensations and feelings of like, okay, I'm, I'm not meant, I was not brought here and, and put on this earth to live the life that, that most people live. So that's my answer. And I think, and I would argue that a lot of people feel that way too. I think that's a more common feeling than we realize. And it's subjective in the way that each of us feel it and it's subjective in the way and when we feel it by doing certain things. But for me, I get that feeling in seeing how I can accomplish really audacious things. That's when I get that feeling. And I don't know if it's because I'm proving to myself that I can do more and be more or if it's a feeling that I'm proving to the rest of the world that they can do more and be more. And so the 40 minute cold plunge, the why behind it is if I can do it, you can do it. If you don't believe me, watch. And after you watch, try. Disclaimer, don't try. Yeah. But but try. You know what I mean? It's just you can do more. You can do, you can always do more. You can always do more. I think there's like the Navy SEAL role. It's like 60, 40 when you're, you think that you're, you're tapped, you can still go 40% longer and do 40% more. I I love that, man. And I think Muhammad Ali talks about when he was in his training, he wouldn't start counting his reps until he was tired or he started to feel tired. Take that approach to everything. And do that for the next year and watch what you accomplish. This, I tweeted this literally right before uh, we sat down. Very eloquent. I said, stop being a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) But the picture below was a guy named Nick Lavery. Lavery, have you heard of him? I have not. You got to look this guy up. I will. Like his his podcast with Jocko Willink is one of my all-time favorite podcasts. And I'm going to do my best to, to do justice to his story because it, it, it speaks directly to what you're talking about. So Nick Lavery, Nick Lavery, college football player, 6'6", six, six, absolutely a unit, just a literal unit. When you think of a, when you think of a warrior, this is the guy. Hmm. And so he goes into special operations, special forces specifically in the, in the U.S. Army. Extremely elite, like some of the most elite warriors that have ever lived in the world, history, like literally ever. He is in one of the Middle Eastern theaters. I cannot remember if it was Afghanistan or Iraq. Long story short, there was a, he he got his leg shot off, like literally by a a PKM machine gun. I believe that's what it's called. It's massive round, literally just like straight up, almost died, was like seconds away, hit his femoral artery, literally his leg was almost off. Yeah. And the picture I posted is him in his special operations military uniform in Afghanistan or Iraq with his weapon in his full kit with a prosthetic leg. He went right back. He went right fucking back. And it's a bad motherfucker right there. The story that he lines out in this podcast, he has a book as well. The, 
the idea, like, so you get your leg blown off. How many reasons do you have to not go back into special operations? Thousands of reasons. The answer is every reason. Every reason. You have every single reason to not, and nobody would ever bat an eye. Literally, yeah. everybody would actually be like, dude, thank you for your service. The respect is unreal. Not only did he go back to special operations, he actually went up a level and became, he, he went through like the most difficult course in all of special operations, uh, or in all of special forces operations, which is like this, this uh, diving course, essentially. So he went through like this course that has this massive attrition rate for people with two legs. And he's got one. And he's got one leg. And so my point, <laughs> like it, it makes me emotional thinking about it. I cried several times during that podcast. And here's how I know it's powerful. I used to do landscaping. I remember the exact yard that I was doing in the exact spot in the, like, I remember moving, like, I associate listening to that podcast with this specific Where you place were with the, at the time. I've mowed thousands of lawns. I remember wow. the exact lawn because I'm like, this is insane. This guy, so the picture, um, the reason I tweeted that and the reason I think it relates is you can always do more. Always. You have a torn ACL, you can finish the race. You can do a 40-minute cold plunge. You can do a 14-day fast. You can do an Ironman. You can start that business. You can start that podcast, blah, blah, blah. Every single thing that you think that you can't do, the reality is that you can. Mm -hmm. It's literally just as simple as committing to it and actually trying. That being said, caveat, you will fail. You will fail. But to me, that picture, I got I to show you that picture before, before we head out here. Um, it's... It's, it's, it, that's, that picture tells a story, bro. And it, it like, it's incredible to see a dude. And I'm sitting here thinking like X, Y, or thing, Z thing in my life is hard right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Come on, bro. Like, dude. And, and like, and there's levels, you know, like I sit here humbled by that story. And then there's somebody out here who has two legs that have been blown off and they, and they go back. And then there's, you know, it's just like, there's always, there's always more that can be done. Always. And the interesting thing too, I, I don't think it's, perhaps I've never spoken with Nick. Um, maybe one day that'd be a cool, cool guest to have on the podcast. But I like to think that he didn't really do it for the, the sole sake of other people. And kind of to speak on what we were just talking about with your Iron Man, half Iron Man. Um, I don't know if people are like, serious about that dude that i don't know either <laughs> but I, I try to say half iron man just in case they yeah. are you know um he d i think that he did it for himself but in him doing that for himself how many other people did something else that they thought was never possible and it kind of go alludes to the idea um and my friend orpheus on the podcast recently talked about this in an airplane what do they always tell you to do if the oxygen goes bad you put, your put it own, on yourself first. You put your own mask on first, and then you help others. Yep. And the idea that a cup, for a cup to overflow, it has to already be full. Mm -hmm. And I think that we fill our cups by these things that you're talking about, by challenging ourselves and learning and progressing and growing and doing more and expanding our, our capacity and energy and competency. And then that's when we overflow into these people, and then they fill their cup, and then that's how the world changes. So... Um, that was long winded, but that kind of leads into what you're doing now, man, with like the riser mm -hmm. network and these dinners. Um, I'm curious if you've always been a connector of people. Like, is that something that you've always done? Even in like your childhood, your, your drinking days, is that something that you've always felt? Always, always. And I think it stemmed from a place of, lack and insecurity early on wanting to feel like I fit in and so I tried to make friends with anybody and everybody and then once I read the book The Go-Giver by Bob Berg where it talks about giving without expecting anything in return that's where the first networking event started so it actually started with an idea of bringing together business owners and entrepreneurs, creatives, influencers in Austin and allowing them to showcase their businesses through like a short speech. And I called these get togethers Austin's most successful under 30. And at the time I'm 
22. So who was I to <laughs> say how Austin's the most successful in their 30? I definitely wasn't, but I was just sending that out to people to get them to show up. And then I would have hand selected anywhere between six and 12 speakers to come up and talk about what, what they're doing. And it was just a, a way to showcase what they, they had going on and, and make them feel incredibly special and heard. And I paid for everything. I paid for the venue. I paid for the food. I paid for the drink and paid for, you know, the marketing blast. Like all of it was just me doing it out of the kindness of my heart. Cause that's what the book tells you to do. Um, but I found that I loved it, man. And other people loved it too. It's like magic in that room. And I'll never forget one of the guys that came to speak. He had started a clothing brand called Sunnyside and 10% of the profits go to support mental health and raise money for those struggling with mental health. And he was about to go out of business and he came and spoke and the room was so impacted by his message that all of the clothes that he brought sold out that, that evening. And I just sat there, I was like, man, there's something here. You know, there's something powerful about bringing people together around a cause of helping one another and helping each other get to where we want to go. That is, is really powerful. And, and so they started to build and grow and build and grow. And I was on a podcast the other night and, um, one of the guys was asking about riser and the people that come to riser, are they all in the real estate world? Are they all in the finance world, the tech world, the fitness world? And I said, no, we kind of have like, we, we kind of have everybody here, anybody and everybody just come as you are. And he said, isn't that counterintuitive? You know, wouldn't you think that you'd want all people in the real estate world or all people in the landscaping world to share best practices? And it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. But what we've actually found is because there are so many different identities here with, within the, the events that we throw, it, it's almost like a, a tribe or a community of barter and exchange, like barter and trade. And it makes sense, you know, historically, like you bring people together and you have um, one person who's a welder, one person who is a dentist, one person who is a fisherman, one person who is a energy healer, right? Like all these different people and they come together and they, they help one another elevate. It's like rising, rising tides raise all ships. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I absolutely started to enjoy connecting people to help them get to where they want to go, or at least be the guy that people come to whenever they need this or that. I'm like, Hey, like I'll point you in the right direction. Um, and after a few of those Austin's most successful under 30 events, one of my friends came to me and was like, dude, you have to turn this into something. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't want to turn it into a business. I don't want to make any money off of this. I'm just doing this because I, I truly enjoy it. I love it. And he goes, but there needs to be production. There needs to be systems. There needs to be processes. Like if you really want this to grow and help more people, then we need to think about it in, in business terms. And, and so we branded it into Riser and then the rest is history, man. They just started to continue to grow, grow, grow. And now we bring in local vendors that come in and showcase their products. And we have speakers and magicians and comedians and DJs and food and drink. And the way that we describe ourselves is we're a networking community unlike any other. No top button suit and tie with a name tag and a little champagne glass. <laughs> you know, it's, it's come as you are. You can dress how you please. And the common theme and the common thread is just be open-minded and give more than, than you receive and you will fit right into this community. Is the name riser from the, that quote, like the idea, you know, I don't know how the heck we came up with the riser. It wasn't even me. I can't take credit for that. Christian, my, my business partner. Uh, and there's another guy that works with us, Zach Barney. I definitely got to give them credit. There's three of us. Um, but yeah, Christian, he's the, he's the uh, vision guy. He came up with, with that name and we're all like, cool, let's do it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good. It, it fits with that <laughs> idea too, like the rising, rising tide. tides. Yeah. yeah. Um, in a way those events can be that tide or are that tide. Mm. I actually gave Harry and, and Brett this compliment last night. They, they had this bring your own steak thing at their office 
And I took note of the fact, I don't know, my dad, my, we've always had people in my house and I've always like, my dad's always cooked, uh, especially on Thanksgiving. Like it's, it's this thing. I've always taken note of like the, the chefs. I don't know why. It's just something that I like, or the host really, mm -hmm. um, because my family was, have, has hosted for like my entire life. And I noticed that they probably cooked 50 steaks. First off, they brought people to their office. Yeah. They paid for like the plates, silverware, uh, drinks, whatever. And, but people bring your own steak. It's the, instead of bring your own beer, bring your own yeah, steak. Beer. B -Y -O -S. <laughs> um, and I noticed they cooked probably 50 steaks. They were kind of in the corner, just literally just on the grill, on the grill, prepping, prepping the steaks. Everybody else is talking, having this good time. And I, I, I took note of this, the fact that they didn't eat until everybody else's steak had been eaten or cooked. Um, and then they, they took the opportunity to eat and then become a part of the, the party. So their value that they provided was creating that environment for other people, which is so cool. That's like a, a it's a innate thing I think we have in, in our physiology, our neurology, where we're tribal creatures, in my opinion, I believe yes. so. And you mentioned like the barter and trade. Exactly. The, the saying, it takes a village, right? It takes a village. It takes to, a village. The reason it takes a village is because everybody has their own thing and then you come together and then you have everybody's thing um, as opposed to it being like only real estate or only whatever. And I, I don't know, I, I, I've never been to one of these events, but I, I assume that compliment can go for you as well in, in the mission of Riser being that that place where people come to expand their lives and you guys almost, it's not like some self-serving thing. It's like you take the back seat. Which and, is and there's so much beauty in taking the back seat. Like I, I'm sure that Brett and Harry can echo the sentiment of being in the corner and being able to provide for everybody else and create the space for magic to happen amongst the rest of the guests is is magic within itself. Just being able to watch that and just see people smile and laugh and be happy. I mean, that is one of the, the special things about life is being able to see other people happy. And in turn, that makes you happy. Like, I, I think I always think of the giving circle, right? Sometimes when you give a gift to somebody, it's, it's better. It's, it's just the greatest feeling in the world. You could argue better than receiving a gift yourself. And so I find myself having resistance to accepting gifts. Sometimes, you know, I'm like, no, that's okay. Like I, I appreciate it, but I, I'm, you keep that, you, you hold on to it. But then you're, you're not allowing that person to feel the same feeling that you feel when you give to them, you know, or you give to others. So you have to allow that giving circle to, to continue in rotation. So I mean, Brett and Harry sitting in the corner and me, Christian and Zach sitting in the corner, just watching everybody just have a, a great time. It's like that feeling of, of giving is, is phenomenal. And um, the, the book Go Giver, is, it just talks all about that. Just give, 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 and it just unlocks so many doors. There's a, I, I had a, a guy named Tommy Spalding who's a, a New York Times bestselling author on the podcast recently. And he wrote a book called number one, I think his first book, he has three books. His first one was, it's not just who you know. Second one was heart led leader. Mm. Third one is gift of influence. And he would actually challenge the ideal ideology of how to win friends and influence people. Interesting. Because he, he, he acknowledges the utility in the, in the book, but the, the way that, uh, I think it's Carnegie who wrote that, right? Yes. The way that he lays it out is it, it's kind of how can I not manipulate, but how can I operate in a way towards other people where I will, it will be reciprocated. Yeah. So his idea, a heart led leader is somebody who may use those same tactics or similar tactics, but from the heart posture of like, I actually don't care what happens in yeah. return. Yeah. It's like the yeah. act the, the it's, it's very difficult to do this. Um, much easier to say, but the idea that you're actually giving without any ex expectation of return. Mm. Um, and I think that that's a prime example of that. 
obviously there is benefit to you for doing that and Harry and Brad and whoever else. But the it, it's a testament to the more that you give, the more that will be given. Always. That's that's how it works. Well, I'll say this. So I think that book probably talks about it coming from a, a genuine place in the heart and it being very authentic. And I can tell just from this conversation, you just genuinely want to learn about me and uncover my story, which, I mean, even that, dude, make, makes me emotional because there's not many times in your life when somebody really just sits there and listens and asks questions and gives you a chance to celebrate your life and look back on your life. And I will forever, forever have your back and I will forever fight for you. I will forever say phenomenal things about you because you're doing it from an authentic place. And I think as long as it is authentic, right? Like, you know, in the book, um, and it lo as long as it comes directly from the heart, then that, that want to give and that want to reciprocate will shine through. Like I, like I, I just, I want to tell everybody about th this podcast already. And I want to listen to every episode. Like that's just been, it's just been such a great experience up to this point. So, um, as long as the person is authentic, I, th I think, I think that it's just very clear to see, like you have that dude, that just that charisma, that, that genuine care. So uh, I, I appreciate it. And you're, I mean, you're a t walking testament and example of that. So. Well, I just I wanted to say that. I appreciate you saying that. That that means a lot, and it it, it kind of speaks. So, so my my idea with this podcast specifically, Tyro mm -hmm. means novice or beginner. Stems from the Latin word meaning young soldier. Young soldier. Somebody who has just entered the military in in the actual context of that word, but the way that I perceive it is just like somebody who's entering into the fight of life or or into a fight because I think I want to die a Tyro. Yeah. Um in the sense, like, I want to elevate, I want to level up, obviously, but I never want to be at the point where I'm like, oh, I, I made it, you know? It's like, there's always more. But the idea, um, I, th I like I mentioned before, I think a lot of podcasts, especially on like the productivity business sort of optimization side of things, they have their place. I'm not discounting them at all. I've listened to plenty of them and I've learned a shit ton. But that's not like what interests me. M my interest is stories, like, the idea of, of your story. How did you get from the kid that was walking into the gym with your dad and thinking I'm different to starting this community and building communities and helping people? I'm interested in learning about Harry and Brett, how they got to meet Mafia. Why did they, like what, what happened in between? Mm -hmm. Because I think you've mentioned the word stories and the stories that we tell ourselves. I think that the stories that we tell ourselves are informed by other people's stories as well hearing somebody's story of triumph, we subconsciously think, hmm, we superimpose ourselves into that life. Would I be, would I do that? Would I finish the race? Yeah. I don't know, let's, well, he did that. Maybe I should, maybe I should step out and try that. Maybe I should do 75 hard, maybe any number of things. The stories are, are so important. So I appreciate you saying that, I really do. Cause that's like my, my main goal from this is to have conversations with people and learn from the stories. Obviously there's people with expertise um, that, that I like to tap into, but even in that sense, I, I like to know like how people got to where they are. And this is an interesting segue. There's something that I've been, I've told myself this for maybe a decade. When people would ask me what I wanted to do, I never said, I want to start a business. I, I, I would say I wanted to be a professional baseball player back in the day. That was like my yeah. main goal until like <clears> two <throat> years ago. But I would always say and think I want to be a connector of people and a facilitator of experience. Mm. And so the reason I'm bringing that up, because I wrote it down, in your conversation with Harry and Brett, you actually literally used connect and facilitate in the same sentence, mm. which to me was like a green light. I'm like, okay, that's, uh, that's interesting. I've actually never really heard somebody say those two words in the same way you said you want to connect people and facilitate events. I'm curious what those two words mean to you and like how they play out in your life. Connection means love. I think we need more of it. 
spending time with one another, being together, relationships, friends, family, experience. That is the important things in life to me. And being able to facilitate that connection is, is happiness, it's peace, it's tranquility. So to me, connection is love and facilitate, facilitate is, is connection as well. <laughs> but I think facilitation is, is meaning to me, meaning in my life. I get meaning from facilitating beautiful moments and experiences that people remember for a lifetime. When I look back on my life, I want to be known as the person that brought people together. When life gets busy and we get caught up in our day to day and we're, we're heads down for days, for weeks, for months, for years, I want to be the person that reminds you but it's all not that serious. At the end of the day, we're going to die. And in the time that we are here, what moments do you remember? And I think it's the moments of just being together. Man, I love it. I love, I love bringing people together. I love having a house and just being like, anybody can come over, you know, come over for brunch on Sunday, hang out late on Saturday you want to come over after work, stop in. Like, I think that is, those, those small things are the best parts about life. Having someone walk in without having to knock on the door. It's like, that stuff, that stuff is so powerful to me. But I just want to connect people, man. And I, I want to bring people together and, um, you know, something that's been really fun about Riser and really fun about the dinner parties that we've been hosting is everybody is so different in the industry that they're in or the jobs that they have. But a common thread amongst everybody is the values are all, all the same, like a very, the same foundation. Treat other people how, not just how you want to be treated, but how they want to be treated. Be present. Look, in the, look them in the eye, ask them questions, show grace, show love, be innately curious, offer value to help them get to where they want to go, offer a connection, and just throw judgment out the door. Man, we, we, we're all more alike than we are different. So connection is love and facilitation for me is, is purpose, it's happiness. We're all more alike than we think that's, um, or than we are different. There's a, a quote, I can't remember who said it. I do this all the time. I don't know who to attribute quotes <laughs> to, but I love, love quotes. I need to start remembering who says them. But I, I got this quote from my buddy Ryan Ayala, and it's, I am not a drop in the ocean, but the ocean in a drop. And what that reminds me mm. of is another quote, I am nothing, I am everything. Mm. Meaning we really are all cut from the same cloth. Like we we are we exist in the same world, the same universe, the same space, the same like energetic field actually, but we are actually all a part of the same thing, right? And I think that's, yes. it's one of the interesting things in life is, is learning how to like, learning how to not manifest, but bring forth that like oneness into real life. And I'll bring up Peyton Elroy again, because I asked her something along the lines of like, what is happiness to you? Or what, like, what is health? We were talking about something. And she basically explained to her, it's like as, as much oneness, like becoming as, as one as, as she could, or as I can, or as we can, like, how does, how does a person become healthy? It's like the becoming whole, which is becoming truthful, which is becoming like your potential. So if that's, of the person, that's the microcosm, the macrocosm as a society, as a tribe, how do we become healthy as a, as a society or a tribe? How do we become whole or how do we become happy? It's 
we become whole, which to do that, we have to connect in person. Not, I mean, social media is a beautiful tool, I think. And only recently have I begun to use it as, as such, but it's a means to an end. It's definitely not the end because the in-person connection that you facilitate and Harry and Brett facilitate and so many other people facilitate is how we get that wholeness. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. No, it completely does. And you can probably speak to the podcasts you've done. They're all phenomenal. You love them. Just talking, connecting, hearing stories. But there's something different about in-person podcasts. There's just a different energy, a different power. And do you know uh, what that is? Well, it's, it's the word, but I, I, I can't remember. Think pot. about it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's exactly that. Shakti it's the pot. same as Spotify concert. Yeah. It's Shakti pot. It's a physical exchange of energy. And I totally relate to that. Sorry to interject. No, I, I knew what word you're thinking of. I just couldn't remember. I'm going to have to get it tattooed on my, my wrist <laughs> or something. So I don't forget. That's Shakti pot. Um, you, you brought them up, but you, you host these dinners, mm. which is sort of like a, I get like a, I, I haven't finished reading war and peace. Have you ever read that book? I have not. Okay, well, it's like this it's sort of like elite Russian aristocratic uh, background, and they have these, like, dinners, Yeah. Uh, at least in the beginning, where, like, people will host, and they'll just come, and they'll sit in the, the drawing room or whatever and just talk. So I get this sort of, like, uh, ancient aristocratic sort of, like, vintage retro vibe, like... Mm -hmm. It's not something that, well, think, it's not something that, like... Red tablecloth yeah, and it, candles and exactly. cigars. Yeah, yeah, that sounds kind of nice. Mob boss. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, my point is, it's not something like, hey, yo, we're all getting together for dinner at, yeah. like, a house. It's usually, hey, you want to go fucking get, get drunk at a bar or yeah. something, right? That's, the, that's how we operate socially. So <laughs> what's, what's the story behind the dinners, man? Because that's pretty cool. Yeah, so it, it started off very transparently as a selfish endeavor for me and my buddy Leo to just want to network and meet with the coolest dudes in Austin. And we're trying to figure out how to do that. If we weren't being invited to where they were going and if we weren't being invited to the parties or the dinners that they were being invited to or they were hosting, then we thought, well, if we're not being invited, we just got to create it ourselves. And so it gave us a reason to reach out to people that guys specifically that we wanted to get in touch with and simply started with the idea of we'll pay for the food. We will find the venue. All we ask is you show up with an open mind and we'll take care of the rest. Most guys are like, okay, I'm busy. I have things going on, but a free meal at a place that uh, at a cool venue, like, yeah, you know, what's the worst that can happen? So the f first few dinners were, were great. We got phenomenal feedback. The response was awesome. Just breaking bread with other high val value men was something that was, I think, attractive to our guests. And then we wanted to take it a step further. We're like, the dinners are great. The food's good. The conversation's good. But how can we make the conversation better? And how can we also make the guests feel very heard and allow them to share their voice, but also showcase what they have going on and make them feel like the man. And so what we started doing at the very beginning of the dinners, I, I go up and I memorize all the intros of each guest. And then I stand there at the end of the table and I intro every single person around the room and they don't say a single word. So immediately everybody in the room, there's this, this energy, this you know, collective consciousness that raises because everyone's very engaged and intrigued as to what's going to happen next, but also feeling like you're sitting at a table, uh, you know, a round table with other knights and, and leaders in the community is very empowering. And then we do about 30 minutes of just regular open conversation. We have all the seats hand-picked it, hand-selected, so you're sitting next to somebody that can offer you value. Um, and then the back half, we do something called a Jeffersonian dinner. So Thomas Jefferson back in the day would bring together the who's who in, in the, the towns that they lived in and or in the town they lived in. And it would be mathematicians, scientists, politicians, like the movers and shakers in the community. And it was called the Leather, Leather Apron Club. And after years 
of these private, exclusive, invite-only dinner parties taking place and important conversations taking place and ideas being shared, sure enough, the Declaration of Independence was, was drafted. And so it's, it's incredible the power that comes from bringing together other people who want to share their ideas and their voice. Um, and the beauty of the Jeffersonian portion of the dinner is only one person's allowed to speak at a time. Leo and I have pre-prompted questions and we're the moderators. We ask those questions and then one person speaks. And after they're done speaking, if somebody else wants to jump in, they can jump in. If they want to interject during the middle of that person speaking, they're welcome to do so. If you want to sit back and observe, you can do that as well. But by allowing each person to share their voice, it gives you a chance to have a sounding board for your own personal ideas. Are these ideas valid? And if they're not valid, maybe somebody else can share their own perspective on it, which will help me then form a better opinion than the one that I currently hold. And some dinners go three hours, some dinners go eight hours. You know, we've had dinners that go past midnight. And so just creating the space and allowing people to just talk is, uh, I, I think not, it's just something that we don't do often enough. And they've just grown and grown and grown and the community has built. And now we have a online uh, WhatsApp group, which we're gonna move to Telegram here soon, um, where guys just share value. You know, they're like, hey, you know, I just listened to this podcast. What do you guys think? Or, hey guys, I just got a flat tire. Who, who do you go to? Or, Hey, I chipped my tooth. Who do you go to? It's like, I mean, it's that barter and trade, you know, that sort of thing. We have experts in each field within, uh, the WhatsApp group and we have different categories. So if you like, you want to go learn about Bitcoin, then you can go hop into this channel and you can ask some guys questions about that. If you want to go learn about how seed oils are affecting our health, you can hop in that channel and ask those experts, right? If you're looking for podcast guests, you hop in the podcast channel. And so it's really, really grown nicely, and um, I'm excited for you to for you to come. We're gonna we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna get you to one here within the next three weeks. I'm gonna hold you to it. Yeah, no, that sounds uh, that sounds incredible, dude. And there there is a need for that. And I'm the two words that came to mind while you were speaking are dialogue and monologue. So we have a lot of dialogue in in the world today, but it's. the potency is, is diluted. It's extremely diluted. Yes. The most effective dialogue in the world, the, the dialogues that have changed human history for the better, perhaps for the worst as well, but for the better 100% is actually just a collection of monologues, giving people the ability to articulate themselves fully. So this is sort of you think about the Gettysburg Address. If I'm not mistaken, that was like a several hour yes. monologue. Yes. You think about the man in the arena speech, that's a monologue. You think about Winston Churchill is famous for these monologues. And then you think about like the world that we live in now. This is why this is literally why Joe Rogan is Joe Rogan and podcasting is what it has become because of people like him. Because people what we're fed on a macro level is these clips. This thirty second Instagram reel, this one and a half minute uh, news conversation that's supposed to e explain or expose like some seriously deep thing. <laughs> yeah. And somebody's supposed to explain it a minute. In 35 and seconds. Yeah it's, yeah. it's, it's Fugazi. It's literally fruitless. It's a, it's a, it's a fool's errand. And the idea that y'all are facilitating that monologue and having people, I mean, I literally get, <laughs> I, I think I literally think about somebody back in, in, like Thomas Jefferson, like them yep. sitting down with their wigs on or whatever, wearing the, whatever <laughs> yeah. clothes they're wearing and like standing. Oh, I forgot up. to mention that you have to wear a wig. Okay. At <laughs> Look, we can make that happen. <laughs> um, smoking a cigar or whatever and yeah. Then, yeah. Like, actually deliberating um, their thoughts, but also delineating. That's one of my favorite words, delineating, mm -hmm. um, because especially as it relates to speaking, writing, and listening. So we can delineate our thoughts, which basically means like, uh, clarify, better understand our thoughts by writing because our thoughts yes. are ethereal in many ways. They're, they're not real until we voice them, write them down, or uh, what we can also do is listen to people. Yes. 
And when you listen to somebody, you have a conversation to yourself, you're like, huh, this is an interesting point. And then it better allows you to speak and delineate your own thoughts. So that's a, what a cool, uh, what a cool idea, man. That's awesome. Yeah. And if you never get a chance to have other people challenge your thoughts, then how do you know if they're valid or not? So being in a space, a, a safe space, a, a space with other guys that you just meet, but immediately trust because of the way that it's catered and we facilitate it, it really allows you to feel comfortable enough to share some of those ideas or opinions that you have that you wouldn't regularly share at the workplace, at the gym, with family. And it's really, really interesting just seeing when somebody says something that other people disagree with, but through that, they find common ground and they may agree to disagree, but at, at the at the end of the day, it brings us all closer together, just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Has there ever been a time where there was like a, a serious disagreement? Yeah, there's been, <laughs> there has, there has uh, disagreements that, that I won't, I won't speak on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, you'll have two guys going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then 10 minutes later, they're like, yeah, we're kind of saying the same thing right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's hilarious. Um, but each of those guys, if they wouldn't have come to that dinner, they probably still would have been continuing on their, their path and life thinking that, you know, they were right. And now again, just inching a little bit closer to where both right, you know, and it's, it's, it's really amazing whenever that happens. Yeah. It's like a respect. It's, it's like a, when you're in the presence of, of, of a group of men that you respect, Yeah, there's a certain level of respect that's shown. And it's also like an accountability thing. Like you can't, it would be foolish. It would, it would be an act of folly to disregard that, that level of respect in that room and go at somebody personally or make a personal argument out of a uh, ideological one or something like that. So that it seems like that's like a perfect safe space is a word or like a term that's kind of, uh, nerfed. Yes. Like that's, that's kind of a nerfed word. And it's like, it sounds just kind of soft. That's a like, great way to describe it. It's yeah. like safe space. Like what does that even mean? But re <laughs> really what that means in this context, I think is like a, a, a space <coughs> where there's enough respect that's, that's in the air almost that's felt by everybody that, that you, you act accordingly as opposed to just like the social media yeah. screaming matches that happen in, in areas where that's not the case. We don't have guys like holding each other, like crying, like yeah. it's, a, it's not Come that on, sort man. of, yeah. it just provides a place where you can voice your opinions without being afraid of being canceled or being attacked for the way you think, which we all, we all have to realize like our opinions and our perspective on life is just simply had because of how we grew up and how we were raised. We can't blame one person or another for having maybe out of pocket opinions or thoughts because that's just, that's just the life that they've lived, you know, but coming together to share those, to see if some of our opinions are flawed is necessary. And that's why we have the dinners. It's uh, my, my coach at VCU used to always say, you know, you know, the term, we are products of our environments. Yes. He would say we're products of our experiences. Yes. Because product of environment is a victim mentality. Yes. Experience is a, the sum of your circumstance and your responses. So it's, it's, there's an element of control and responsibility and ownership that's, that's wrapped in that, in that small change of phrase. Product of environment, uh, product of experience as opposed to product of environment. I think you're exactly right. There's there's a there's an interesting thing like conversations like this. What what happens is that I'm now more familiar with your environment that you grew up in. Yes. And thus your experience. So now I'm more familiar with you as a human, and that's how we grow to understand and build rapport and then connect in, in that way. So I, I got to commend you for that. I'm definitely. Uh, if I got the invitation, I'll I'll make my way out there, man. That that sounds Please, awesome, brother. Please. What's the what's the food of choice typically? I, I'm glad you asked. So we get everything catered by Ziki. Um, and for those who don't know, Ziki is a 
fast food chain here in Austin, but it's not your typical fast fast food. So yes, they're open till four in the morning or three in the morning, but it is all grass fed, farm to table, organic. They cook their food in tallow and ghee. There's no seed oils. So it is the highest quality ingredients possible. The food is phenomenal and it tastes amazing. So we partner with them for those reasons. I've never had it. Never. I've, yeah, I've been in Austin for like three months now, and I've never had it. Man, so I, if you ever drive around on South Lamar, South Congress, up in Burnett, or, or down, or, you know, out in Dripping Springs, you'll see these pink food trucks with you know yellow letters, and uh, and that's Ziki Free, man. I I I can't talk about them enough. What should They're I great. get if I go? Are you a are you a burger type of guy? Are you like a bull? Or are you like burritos? I like beef predominantly. <laughs> like I eat a lot of beef. <laughs> Yeah, just go get, <laughs> go get a couple patties. Hold hold the bun, you know. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Keep the bun. Keep the bun. Dude, yeah, Smash Burger's phenomenal. Yeah, the uh, yeah, you would dig that, man. It's it's great, great food, high quality. I'll have to check that out soon. The 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 idea of Ziki, I, I don't know. I've actually, I mean, I've lived in eight places in America for more than a month or so. So like I say that I've lived in eight different cities, towns, like literally wow. from Texas, Florida, Maine, New York, Atlanta, Virginia, all like pretty, pretty east all inside. Over. Yeah. But I say that because I've been in a lot of places in terms of different communities. Some of these people like Milton, New Hampshire, literally yeah. it, it's a town, but it actually doesn't even have a, there's no light. Like, no kidding. Literally, it's Stop like, signs. It's literally That's like it. 20 people. Wow. Um, and then I've grown, I grew up 15 minutes from downtown Atlanta with six, seven million people. So I say that because Austin is so unique. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> and the reason I bring that up now is because a place like Zeke, I don't know. I, I've never been to like San Diego. Maybe there's places like that in other places, but I've never heard of them. I've mm-hmm. never heard of like a place like Hop Daddy that just now they use force of nature meat and they don't use seed oils they only cook their stuff in like high quality oils do they really uh, they i'm pretty sure they just made that announcement wow. that popped off so that's amazing my point with that is like it's a representation of the demand in the area which is ziki's in austin obviously so that's yes. the demand that there's enough demand going around that they made that decision from a business perspective but on the on the topic of austin like how how has living in austin affected you or how, how like vice versa how how do you uh think Austin has changed you as a person. Active lifestyle is the biggest thing. And and understanding that our health is incredibly important. Being in Austin, you have the Turkey Trot, you have the Marathon, you have the Cap City Tri, you have South by Southwest, you have ACL, I mean, all these things are outdoors and, and I know a lot of cities have outdoor events, but like there is a sense of encouragement to be healthy, stay healthy, go run Town Lake Trail, go to Barton Springs, go wakeboard in, you know, on Lake Austin, go paddleboard on Ladybird Lake. Like I, I, I don't think I'll ever leave Austin because people here get it. I think that's the best way for me to describe it. It's a place where if you go outside during the middle of the day and walk out your corporate office and take off your button down and just sit in the sun and have your lunch, like (laughs) nobody's going to judge you for it. Like they get it, you know, like health is incredibly important. If you go to the gym, you take off your shoes and, you know, walk out into the grass and sit there barefoot for a few minutes, like (laughs) nobody's going to judge you for it, man. It's like, it's, it's, it's the root. It's the, it's the, the foundation of what we should be doing. It's sunlight, it's grounding, it's drinking good water, it's exercise, it's proper sleep. I mean, that is, that is what Austin is in my opinion, proper nutrition, proper diet, community, friends, play, run, dance, have fun. I mean, I I think, you know, I, I have family in, in the Midwest and, um, you know, family in the panhandle and saying these things, they'd give me a, a hard time. You know, they call me a hippie and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> man, I get it. Like I get it, but don't knock it until you try it. That's, that's all I'll say, man. 
it, I feel great. Life is good. And I think it's because I, I try to simplify and just do the things that we're supposed to do biologically as, as humans. And Austin is a place that facilitates that, honestly. And there's a visceral energy in, in yeah. Austin. And it's also... Chris Williamson spoke on this, but there's, there's, I've never been in a place where like social people are so eager to connect. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's very fertile soil in terms of connection and just like social built social ability and, and building friend, friend groups and friendships and relationships. It's like something that's like woven into the, the thread of the city. Whereas so it's many amazing. other cities have this like isolative feeling. I don't know. And it's also, uh, I mentioned this last night and, uh, Danny Miranda, who has a podcast in Austin, um, he, he lived in New York a little bit and he said that when he was in New York, people invite you to a party, you bring a bottle of wine mm-hmm. in Austin, people invite you to a party, you bring a book. <laughs> and it's, it's literally like, it's kind of that way. And yeah. obviously there's, you can have um, your drinks here, that's for sure, but it, it sort of speaks to the overall temperament of the city and the people that reside here, and I, it's it's a cool place. Yeah, you get invited to a party and you bring a steak. That's oh, what yeah. I told Harry and Brad. I was like, or BYOS. Like, it's not bring your own beer anymore. But um, we're pushing up on the close to the two-hour mark, and I, I have a, a question that I've asked a lot of people. I used to ask everybody, but then I kind of went away from it. But like I mentioned, Tyro experience is the experience of being a tyro the experience of being a novice a beginner somebody who's curious to a fault Mm. somebody who's in an arena picking up their sword running towards the middle as opposed to the people that are either cowering in the corner trying to get out of the arena not uh, maybe not even not sure what arena they're in but they're not running towards the middle so my question to you is what are you picking up your sword and running toward? Like, what is the arena that you're in? What are you fighting for? That's a phenomenal question. I think I'm, I'm running. Ahead. Of. Who I was one second ago. And then in a second, I'll be running ahead of me one second ago, over and over and over. When I was running my last stretch during the half Ironman, the sun was to my left, casting a shadow over my right shoulder. And all I could think about was the old me on my heels. So to sum it up, I'm just running from or maybe running to a better version of myself every day. Well said, bro. <laughs> That's yeah, I mean, I relate to that. I think many people do. That was phenomenally said. I want to thank you, Matt, for, for coming on, taking the time. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I think what you're doing is incredible. We need more of it. And I think that your life will continue to be fruitful because of of the things that you're giving and the things that you're facilitating. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Right on. And with that, I hope you all enjoyed the conversation with Matt. I think Matt has insights and lessons from his unique life thus far that we can all extrapolate and implement into our own lives, whether that be running an Ironman with a torn ACL, doing a 40-minute cold plunge, starting a business, writing a book, just connecting with people and learning more about people. I think all of these things are so important in today's world. It was an honor uh, to sit down with him. I'm grateful that I had the opportunity. I hope you all enjoy. Until next time, stand firm in the arena.